uh, assalamu alaikum everyone my name is uh, khwaja anik uh, today we'll be talking about uh, systems engineering uh, today's session will go through most of the stuff around how systems engineering works what are the procedures uh, what is the main approach that everyone has adopted throughout the years in the past in different fields and we'll briefly go through uh, high level stuff because uh, system engineering is a really vast field so will i have picked and chosen key, a few of the key stuff that that will add value to anyone uh, trying to get to grips of what system engineering is and then i leave it upon everyone else's interest to just dig deep or keep digging through the standards and the information available on the internet uh, in regards to the relevant aspects that i'll discuss today because uh, it is really hard to to collect all information and deliver to everyone in 45 minutes time i guess uh, uh, i'll i'll start from system engineering history uh, before coming to the history i'll talk about system engineering as a whole that uh, people tend to confuse systems engineering with uh, what we call uh, control systems that uh, control systems uh, uh, commissioning activities control system design activities uh, system engineering on the whole is basically talking about a product how a product or how a project or a system can be designed can be constructed what are the life cycle stages uh, what are the aspects that need to be considered what are the aspects that that are really critical uh, to get the product or the system in line and get it delivered within time uh, it talks broadly about most of the stuff around uh, interfaces around um, your requirements management, uh, your configuration items, and whatnot. So we'll go through this stuff, but uh, it's it's a really vast field with different approaches in different industries. Uh, historically, if I talk about uh, history, uh, its origins date back to 1940s and 50s when Bell Labs started using the system engineering approach. Obviously, it was not known at that time, or there were no standards available, and there was nothing of a, a conventional mechanism or documented way so it was sort of the start of a journey where people started realizing that when they had to produce a product when they had to deliver a system they had to deliver a project uh, they needed some sort of an approach that was holistic and that provided means to track things when they are changing changing in time changing in cost changing in uh, their own properties and characteristics given the knowledge people gain throughout the uh, life cycle and i'm i'm using the term life cycle we'll we'll touch upon it later today so bell labs which was uh, from uh, originated from granville's own uh, household uh, projects and then he uh, he coordinated yeah. with the uh, at&t and started his work so that's the basic uh, start of system engineering uh, similarly uh, similarly, you have uh, World War II as one of the key key uh, era where defense started using systems engineering. And similarly, at the, around that time, post World War II, we had NASA as well. NASA started using the system engineering approach, started using the requirements management approach uh, to deliver their systems and the complex engineering outputs and products utilizing a system engineering approach. A few of the early pioneers that I've listed down here are belong to different fields. So their major major uh, qualification and their major fields were electrical or, or telecom and uh, defense and those kind of things. But if you look at the names and you research them, you'll find that some belong to DOD, uh, Department of Defense, some were NASA, some were uh, Bell Labs, some were different uh, control system specialists or computer, IBM, etc. So, so what I'm trying to make a point here is that system engineering is not a field that's, that's, that can be narrowed down to one uh, basic uh, home. Like you cannot say it's, it, it is only utilized in aerospace. You cannot say it's only utilized in uh, DOD projects. So its application is quite vast. And uh, if uh, and the application uh, in Australia is widely 
applied in defense projects and in railway infrastructure. Uh, the other application I've seen of system engineering is on petrochemical projects, power plant projects. So wherever you have got a product that you need to deliver, wherever you have got a system that you need to deliver, wherever you have got a, a massive scale complex, uh, complicated systems that you need to produce at the end of a uh, journey or in result of a need analysis, then system engineering is a widely known approach uh, that is utilized. Uh, there is a latest development in uh, system engineering, which is model-based system engineering, MBSC. Uh, we haven't utilized it as much, uh, or I haven't seen the application of it much, but it's more, more in the software industry where the software or the systems that are developed as a product is utilized. Uh, my application has been limited on, on railway infrastructure with uh, application on uh, tracks, structures, application on tunnel vents, application on... Uh, overhead wiring control systems, substation and, and et cetera. Uh, and I'll, I'll take examples from those while explaining to you some context and, and some specific items during the course of the next 40 minutes. Uh, if we try to define, there are several definitions available in different uh, locations and different standards. Uh, the the key one or the basic one is that it's a it's a multidisciplinary field that uh, spurs from the engagement between different uh, different disciplines and how they manage complex systems over the span of the life cycle, which is from a birth of an idea or a need to the utilization or delivery, or you can even say to the disposal or retirement of a product or a project or a system. Uh, the key elements of system engineering are uh, RAMs, are uh, system safety interface management, configuration management, uh, requirements management is a key, key part of system engineering. So these are the few aspects that are always part and parcel of system engineering. And system engineering ensures that these aspects are are delivered in time, are tracked during the course of the project, uh, and are delivered and and contribute to the holistic goal of producing a system that's uh, as per the needs of a of a stakeholder or a client or a user. Uh, talking about the sources where you can find information about it, there is a. Uh, International Council of System Engineering in COSE organization that has got a system engineering handbook, which is CBOC, just which is called CBOC as well. Uh, it has got uh, version four right now. Uh, in 2015, it was released from memory. That's a good source. Uh, then we have got uh, obviously IEEE 42010, which focuses on software engineering and system lifecycle processes. And then we have got uh, IEEE 15288, which has got two versions uh, that talk about two different applications and reviews and audits. Uh, there's another uh, application, uh, sorry, uh, standard IEEE 1220 that talks about the management and application of system engineering as a process. So it's, it's also a high level document. Uh, the difference between these sources is is the application that they are supporting. Uh, the difference of system engineering in different aspects or different fields is more around the fact that you've got some time to deliver a software, you have got to deliver a control system uh, or a computer. Uh, sometimes you have to deliver a project, you have to deliver a uh, railway infrastructure, you have to deliver a space shuttle, or sometimes you might just need to modify a space shuttle boosters, for example. So, so it, it depends on the project, it depends on what's the need, what you are delivering, and then the complexity that uh, that project brings. And then the approach that you have to adopt from the system engineering standardized processes is sometimes tailored, tailored to the need of the project, tailored to the time scales that you're trying to deliver. Uh, it might not require the whole, a whole uh, array of documents that they have listed because they might not exist because of uh, the nature of the works. For example, if you are just working track works, then you won't need something that control system will require because there won't be any software development. There won't be any SIL rated equipment. It will be a track, a physical infrastructure that will be worked on. So, 
so depending on the complexity of the project, depending on the nature of the project, criticality of the project, uh, it can be tailored. By tailored, I don't mean to say that we skip a beat, we skip some steps, we skip some documents. Documentation. The tailoring is that you can merge some steps. You can uh, merge some some specific uh, documents. You can combine them into one. And the the main thing is to meet the intent or meet the requirements of these system engineering processes. Uh, the main thing in Australia is that uh, different organizations, different uh, different states have got different rules and regulations. They have got different standards in New South Wales. You'll find that there are ASA standards uh, for railway infrastructure that dictate how system engineering, uh, system insurance or requirements management is done. And there are standards available on ASA website that you can uh, Google and you can find through them. They are publicly available. And then in, in Victoria, you'll find different set of uh, in-house standards that organizations who are leading these projects have got and and those the root of all those documents or standards based on projects are basically a few of these so they will always those project owners or clients will always reference these standards that they would like uh, the the contractor to adhere to and they will make it clear that which standards and which compliance is required during the course of the project so System engineering is a core aspect to deliver a project or a product, but I'll, I'll, from now on, I'll most probably use the term project because I've been involved in, in delivering infrastructure projects in the past, and that will be quite easy to understand. So just consider it synonymous between project and a product because at the end of the day, you have to deliver something which is called a system as a whole. And we'll, we'll touch uh, soon on what is a system, but uh, just keep that in mind that if somebody calls that you have to deliver a product or you have to deliver a system, you have to deliver infrastructure, you have to deliver rolling stock. Whenever you have to deliver something, that last entity, that physical item that you will get at the end of the day is basically what you're working towards and that's your system in itself. Uh, this I've already covered, the system engineering is basically system integration, requirements management, uh, requirements management has two key elements, verification and validation that we will also touch upon. Uh, I won't touch all of these. I'll primarily focus on V life cycle and requirements management, but this is a field that as soon as you go start, as soon as you start going in depth into this information, you'll realize that there's a whole area of documentation available that you can reflect upon. Um, so in order to understand system engineering, it's, it's, it's really important to understand what, how a system is characterized or how a system is built. Um, IEEE IEC 152 basically says that it's a combination of interacting elements which interact with each other, which are organized in a fashion that they deliver uh, a output or a stated purpose. When they say stated purpose, the stated purpose is basically delivering the final outcome, which was a need. Uh, it's it's a complex problem that you can you can arrange in a manner that suits you, and then you come up with a solution to to deliver the final system. Like I said, if it is a rolling stock, it can be made. Uh, if you look at the hierarchical view uh, at the bottom of the screen, the system is made up of several subsystems, and each subsystem can be made up of several further subsystems. Uh, these subsystems. Uh, if you take an example of a rolling stock, for, uh, you'll see that a rolling stock is just not a metal cabin. By rolling stock, I mean a train. It's not a metal cabin. It will have an engine. Uh, that can be a subsystem. It will have vents. That can be a subsystem. It will have a control system. It will have wheels. It will have brakes and X, Y, Z. So rolling stock can be your system, but then it has to be disintegrated. It has to be broken down into fine, finite small elements that that you can measure, that you can design, that you can construct, that you can basically quantify and then deliver towards. So once you deliver towards those goals, you'll, you'll be mapping towards your final goal of a rolling stock delivery. Uh, so that's, that's how you look at a system that, uh, for example, a control system, uh, you're designing control system which will have servers, which will have automation software, which will have uh, networking uh, platforms, it will have ethernet, it will have fiber uh, connectivity and X, Y, and power supplies and internet power supply. So all those elements that together make up a system, a control system 
are all subsystems or sub elements of that system. So as long as we can identify those smaller parts and we can arrange them in a fashion that collectively we know that they will make up the system, then we can work towards those subsystems rather than the rolling stock because overnight we cannot produce a rolling stock. Overnight we cannot produce a rolling uh, control system. We'll have to work towards combining these smaller elements, making sure they all work in their own right, making sure that uh, they are contributing to the main goal of achieving what we need them to work on, what we need from them as a performance aspect, what we need them from a functional aspect. And then we work towards the final system. That's the fashion how system is broken down. Uh, there are two, two categories a system can be defined with, a functional and a physical. Uh, functional is basically a logical. Uh, breakdown, uh, how system will interact with each other, how it will be tested, what are the logical functions it will perform. And a physical is basically the elements that are physical in nature. So again, a rolling stock, a brake is a physical system, but how brakes will be applied or what other functional items that will contribute to brakes being applied are the functional systems that contribute to that physical. And then you map those functional systems that how they contribute or how they link to the physical systems application. And that's how you come up with uh, two, two kind of lists or two kind of uh, documents that are functional systems and the physical systems that clearly articulate, clearly define how your holistic high level system looks like. So in order to come up with a, a clear picture or clear view that how your system will be portrayed, you need to have two kind of uh, architectures that uh, that are built. One is a functional architecture and one is a physical architecture. Uh, and both talk to each other, but both are representing different views. So rolling stock again, uh, your functional architecture will show uh, how it's communicating to your signaling system, how it is communicating or con in contact with its power supply, how it's uh, applying brakes, how it's uh, considering signaling changes, how it's uh, coordinating with the uh, vents, how it's just keeping afloat the aircon and etc. But then the physical structure will be the physical outlay of the whole rolling stock. The physical architecture will be where the wheels go, where the brakes go, where the aircon vent goes, where XYZ windows, whatnot. So it's, it's two different structures or architectures that basically provide the information for anyone who, who wants to deliver that system. And this cannot be produced overnight, and that's the key. Uh, there's a whole heap of process behind uh, behind the system engineering that you need to apply before coming to function and physical architecture. Uh, I won't go into the detail of functional and physical architectures uh, because it's it's a, a different beast and it's it's a bit different in the sense that you need to have physical examples where you can work through to come up with functional physical architectures. And, and that's a whole specialized field where people uh, who are really good at uh, what they do in terms of creating architectures out of, out of requirements and, and creating them in an iterative process from the birth of an idea to uh, when they can do the detailed design. Uh, there's one something called system breakdown structure, which is uh, a logical decomposition of a, of a system. Uh, it's, it's, it's basically what I showed uh, earlier in the hierarchical system that uh, how we categorize our systems. In some projects I've seen that the system breakdown structure was simply how, how the design packages were broken down. So a system, like I said, a track, uh, then you have to put tracks in XYZ locations. So your subsystems or your breakdown structure might depict that track goes in uh, Footscray, let's say, but uh, it's leading up to Footscray, then you'll have several other locations or zones that are your sub elements where you need to put it. And then in the end, you'll achieve the main goal of putting tracks into Footscray station or near Footscray. And similarly, if you're talking about uh, uh, control system, then how, how your control system will come together and make a holistic uh, automation system and then you need to consider how that subsystem is broken down. How does your system breakdown structure looks like? Is it based on physical aspects? Is it based on logical aspects? Is it based on your preference that how you will test it? Is it based on how you will procure it? So SBS basically system breakdown structure leads, leads how you will deliver something, leads the way you will deliver your project or a product. 
this is our, our typical SPS. Uh, it's it's available online. If you Google it, it's on ASA website in the uh, requirements ma uh, management framework document, and it's a, a typical example of how how ASA Asset Standards Authority looks at uh, how our system breakdown structure should look like. And if you notice, they have got a railway system in on the top where they are suggesting that let's say somebody wants a, a new network, a new railway extension, and then when you disintegrated into key aspects, then you have got a communication control system, rolling stock infrastructure, and then you've got system facilities, training facilities, and system data documentation spheres. And then they have been further broken down. So the criteria they have used is a bit different because on the pink side, they have got physical systems uh, like rolling stock infrastructure or, or comms. But on the right hand side in the blue box, they have got different requirements. They have got the uh, facilities, they have got the documentation they need, the spares they need. So these are sometimes ignored, these items on the right hand side, because people are so focused on the physical uh, delivery of uh, comms or rolling stock or other infrastructure that they forget that the things that support it in the long run, in the life cycle of that asset uh, need to be there as well. So it's it's really important to identify how your uh, system will be broken down into smaller pieces and you, what you include in it. You can include anything because it's not prescribed in, I haven't seen it prescribed and I haven't seen a consistent approach where you have got XYZ as predefined SPS elements. So it's it's up to the project. It's up to the people who are working on on system engineering team who are working with the designers to come up with a strategy to come up with an approach that suits the project that suits the complexity. Uh, if it's a simple project of upgrades, you don't need these facilities. You don't need these uh, logical supports, maintenance facilities, or spares because that's an upgrade. That's a known system that's already there, and that's a brownfield project. So you don't need to provide new facilities because the facilities are already there. You might need to upgrade the facilities that can be your SPS element that you need to deliver on. So it's it's basically tracking what you need to deliver as an asset, or what you need to deliver as a system and working towards the goal of meeting these smaller subsystems so that the whole railway system can be delivered. Uh, next one is, so this was more around the system and I'll move on because we have taken so much time. We have, I'll move on to the V life cycle. Um, v life cycle in a nutshell is from the left hand side, it's basically a birth of an idea where it started and then leading up to the uh, integration on the right hand side. If you go through the life cycle, the left hand side is always the concept, the idea, the, the design. Uh, and on the right hand side, you will see the integration, the interface, the validation. We'll touch upon validation soon. So the right hand side is validation and X, Y, Z. So, so these two life cycle together make the V life cycle. Um, I think I've got another uh, depictions which has got much more detail. So I'll show that later. Uh, what happens in the concept phase, and I'll try to stick to this one, is that, that prior to concept phase, there is a how a project starts, how a product starts. It starts with an idea, it starts with a need, uh, a need for railway, a need for railway extension, considering the population growth. Uh, idea or a need for new roads, new infrastructure, idea for man's need or desire to go to the moon. Uh, these are the kind of things that, that spur the idea. And then you start working towards what are the key aspects you want? What are the goal you want to achieve. So when somebody thought they should go to the moon, the first idea was, let's go to the moon. We need to go to the moon. Uh, and then from that onwards, from that point onwards, the idea began a reality. And how it became a reality was somebody started working on, okay, in order to get to the moon, what do we need? Uh, we need a, a aircraft. Okay, in order to get an aircraft, how will it get? So it needs booster. Okay, so it, it needs a station. It needs a booster launching pad and whatnot. So, so that was an iterative process. So no idea born can be traced to any, any physical design because you have to go through a journey. You have to come up with, with uh, ideas, further requirements, further aspects that you need to meet in order to get to your final goal of extended railway network, uh, getting to the moon and et cetera. Uh, 
So these are the key ones, high level items on the V life cycle that you can see. Uh, it starts with the concept phase where requirements are consolidated. And then during the preliminary design phase, uh, the ideas are, are created on design, designs are created, and then the, it's a feedback process. It's an iterative process where the designer informs the requirements sometimes. Sometimes there are derived requirements. Derived requirements are basically a subset of requirements. We'll touch upon that later, but uh, derived requirements are, are a requirement is for uh, our railway extension, and then the subset will be uh, where do you need the stations? Where do you need the uh, tracks to go from? And then the further subset will be how bigger station you need. So it's it's informing the requirements at the time you're designing as well. You start designing the network, you start extending the tracks, you start extending the stations, and then you realize, okay, you want, your requirement at the high level was too high. You need to put in more. You need to put in more information so that whoever is designing it can, can design to something that can be quantified, can design to something that is tangible. So then it's easy to measure that did we meet the intent and how this is how you disintegrate a high level requirement into a smaller requirements that collectively uh, meet the goal. And then you have got uh, in during the preliminary design phase, you've got analysis that happens and then you've got detailed design at the bottom. Uh, and the detail design is the point where your requirements are set uh, in stone and then you work towards the delivery of uh, IFC drawings which are issued for construction drawings and then you work towards the right hand side and as soon as you do the uh, IFU drawings and uh, you you complete things on paper you start constructing them and that's the right hand side you start commissioning them you start manufacturing in a product and the right hand side model starts taking shape uh, you build a unit or a model or a subsystem element for a control system and then you start verifying that the design set to put a PCB in. Did the manufacturing manufactured product had a PCB? Okay, it had these attributes in the design. Does it have those attributes that's manufactured? So that's matching and that's verification that the constructed element meets the design. But then when you go to integration testing and you go to acceptance, that's the point where you have got the validation. The validation is basically saying that we built something to design, but does it meet the intent? Does it meet the need? Did we get to the moon or not? We built a space shuttle based on design, but will it take us to the moon? So there has to be tests run to, to ensure that that happens. We built a rolling stock based on a design, but then there has to be tests run on a live network uh, with the trains which are empty that will ensure that the, the system or the rolling stock that has been designed and built meets the requirement that it should be operable at 100 kilometers per hour. It should break at XYZ deceleration speed. Uh, it should communicate to the CBTC or a signaling control system and whatnot. So those are the kind of things that happen during the validation phase. Uh, I'll move on because time is short. Uh, this is a, a basic rundown of how of what a system engineering process looks like or a life cycle looks like. Uh, in projects in PMP, uh, through PMI Institute, uh, they call it acquisition phase, utilization phase, retirement phase. Uh, the key aspects of system engineering are focused on from acquisition phase to the utilization phase, as you can see on the uh, in the picture in front of you. Before that, it's a need idea, where pre-acquisition phase, where the uh, idea gets thrown into the mix, people yeah. approve it. People who have got means to budget it, approve it uh, from um, organizations, government organizations. Uh, and then you have got a retirement phase where it's basically a disposal, how you will dispose of. It's just like a nuclear plant if it is, has to, there has to be a consideration of uh, if you have got a nuclear plant and you have built it, how you will dispose it off safely. So when a system engineering is applied in a nuclear plant, they will have to have those considerations at the start of the project. And that will be implemented during the course of the time. It won't be utilized, like there might be some measures they might take, uh, some lockdowns that might need to happen, there might be some procedures, but that won't take into effect once the life cycle is finished. After the life cycle of the physical assets finished, then when the disposal time comes through, when the retirement phase comes through, then they will utilize those system engineering aspects that were documented 40, 50, 60 years ago. And same goes with the rolling stock, same goes with the product. For example, iPhones, they say that you need to dispose them off safely. So they must have a, a, a proper way to dispose of their iPhone batteries for, for 
uh, our, our cells that we use, everything that has got a, a disposal mechanism that would be documented. So that those are small examples. Uh, if we look at the project, the major responsibility during those life cycle stages are basically during the concept design, it's usually the stakeholder requirements identification, the, the buildup of system requirements. So what system requirement does is that it comes up with a set of requirements that uh, someone needs to adhere to in order to meet the high level system goal. Now, it's, it's written in stone, but there is always a chance that during the detailed design phase, people will come up with better solution because they'll have more information, more survey data, more physical tests done. Um, and then they can come back and say that this is not possible. Uh, you can have a site that uh, on the surface, it soil was good, but then after two years of hard work and design, you realize that the uh, ground wasn't good enough. You can have a product that you started manufacturing under a pretense and then you realize that it's it's not meeting the needs or the size doesn't fit or something went wrong. And then you have to go back and revise your system requirements. But system requirements are basically the the point where a contract is, is provided to uh, teams of uh, contractors who build on based on those system requirement specifications, which is called SRS. Uh, this picture shows SY just to distinguish it from other requirements. Uh, at the start of a project, you need to identify stakeholder requirements. Stakeholder requirements are key because as long as you don't, as, as long as you know what a stakeholder needs and wants, then you can only design a system requirement. If you don't know what they need, then you cannot. Um, moving on, then there's a, contractor who delivers it and once they have delivered it and constructed it, then you have got a user acceptance or acceptance test and the operational use phase on the right hand side, which is called the utilization 